In today's episode, I chat with artist Victor Gadino about one of his latest pieces, which will be on view during Art Basel Week at Context Art Miami, inside our booth. So if you happen to be in Miami from December 5th to the 10th, make sure you stop by Context Art Miami. We're going to be at booth 831. Have a great selection of works, and we hope to see you there. Welcome to 33PA. The Art Insider Podcast, a production of Territory Contemporary Gallery and Poets Artists. In each episode, we handpick a painting from our gallery's inventory and chat with the artists to peel back the layers and stories that make each piece an extraordinary work of art. I'm Sergio Gomez, Gallery Director, and your personal guide on today's artistic journey. Before we explore today's masterpiece, I invite you to visit TerritoryContemporary.com to discover new works, Follow your favorite artists and sign up for our gallery's weekly newsletter. Victor is a New Yorker turned Miami resident with an MFA from Pratt Institute. His striking oil paintings redefine classic themes. His works have been featured in a number of museums and private collections of icons like George Lucas and Clint Eastwood. And today I have an exciting chat with him in the studio. Well, I'm looking forward to chatting with you today, you know, about uh, your work and about this particular painting that we're going to focus on. It's called COVID-2033, right? Looking right. like into the future as we also kind of look back a little bit through that painting. Yes. And it's going to be a, a great chat. But before we go there, uh, it's great, uh, you know, chatting with you. We were together in Miami during the fair out of Wynwood with Territory Contemporary. And uh, you were there. You had, you know, some of your pieces were Grab really a lot of attention. It was really fun uh, seeing you there. Did you enjoy that? Oh, it was amazing. Yes. I'm really looking forward to the context in our Basel coming up. That's going to be amazing. But yes, I mean, that was like a big, that was a pretty big venue that uh, Art Miami. It was, it was nice to be included. It was interesting mm-hmm. to meet people, hear their comments. It was, uh, it was a great event. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's going to be uh, now even double, double the fun. <laughs> Miami gets crazy. The <laughs> right. week of Basel, it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's, classic. it's a nightmare, but it's, I mean, it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of things going on. Uh, it's, a, it's an amazing week. Yeah. yeah. And, and of course, uh, one of the uh, things I remember too is uh, that breakfast that we had after, you know, right by your house in that little uh, breakfast place. I've got, place. Yeah, I've got a new place also for dinner. Maybe if we get to have a dinner together, I've got a good <laughs> place you're going to really like also. <laughs> Oh, okay, great. Now, now I'm really more looking forward to it. And that, the good thing now, as our friends know, here probably in the podcast, there's the Contemporary Gallery, we're moving to Miami area. So, you know, now we'll be closer and uh, hopefully we can have more of those uh, times to sit down and chat and talk hard. Mm-hmm. That'd be great. Exactly. So let's uh, talk about this beautiful painting that we have, uh, you know, to discuss. It's a squared work, uh, 14 by 14 inches. It's one of the pieces that will also be featured uh, during the fair here in Miami, during Art Basel for Art, for Context. And uh, it's a piece that, let's first describe it for our friends who are listening in the podcast. Uh-huh. And of course, they can you know, check it out from the link that we have and also on our website. But the way I would describe it first, and then you can help me, you know, describe it also in your own words. The way I de- would describe it is like this: there's this scene that almost feels like it could be from a movie set. You know, um, it's this beautiful woman, with beautiful hair. She's blonde. She's looking, uh, you know, towards the side, not to the viewer. We're, we're kind of looking at her as she's looking into the distance, or look, something happening in front of her. She's wearing this huge giant gas mask, like I mean, oversized <laughs> gas mask, uh, right on her, on her, covering her nose, her mouth. Um, she has like beautiful makeup, so it's not. She doesn't seem to be in distress, like she's running away from something. Yet she's wearing this huge gas mask that even has like this giant tube connected to something, right? So, correct. So it's like almost connecting this. Uh, this scene from Hollywood and then, uh, you know, at the same time, the scenes of war that we have uh, become so familiar with, unfortunately, with everything happening in the news as well. And yes. then we we have in the back of her, all we see is like red clouds over a dark sky. So definitely like this sense of fire or danger, mm-hmm. something happening. Yes. Uh, as we look at it, there's no horizon line that is defined. So, because again, this cloud is pretty much taking over and 
And that's how I would describe it. What did I miss? How would you describe it? That's an excellent, I, can, I, I couldn't do it better myself. That's an excellent description of what's going on. Because this is actually the interesting thing about this piece is it's the first time that I started to play a little bit with AI. I have very mixed feelings about AI. Uh, you know, having had a very successful long career as an illustrator, I went through how things changed when everything went digital. That changed my career drastically, but I still held on and had to uh, you know, invent, reinvent myself. Now AI has come along. I, there's no putting the genie back in the bottle. It, it's That's here right. to stay, you know? And uh, there's some things that I think are amazing and some things that are a little upsetting about it, you know? I think uh, as a tool for an artist, it could be amazing, which is how I used it because I would never take an image just that AI created and just use it as my reference. I mean, that's just, I, I don't think it's, which is not me. Because first mm -hmm. of all, it never gives me exactly what I would want. So, so in this one, I started out with AI, but then I've made a lot of changes in, in, while I was working in Photoshop, created the image in Photoshop. Then I, from what I usually do is my, my process is I'll have a, a print made and I'll work from the print to transfer it onto the canvas to start painting. Sometimes now I'm using also uh, trying to get up to modern age and I'm using a laptop to, to see the image. Sometimes it's easy to play around and see the details and things. So, but it's definitely AI is a, definitely an amazing tool. Um, the, thing that, the thing that concerns me that I don't like about it is I see a lot of people creating images and I, you have no idea what, what, where their talent is or if they have any talent at all but they're creating some amazing, some are amazing images and they're making digital prints of them and selling them as art. And I wonder if the people that are buying these things are thinking they're really buying art from this person or do they realize this person maybe typed a few words in and that's it and they print this thing up and, you know, so that's, that's concerning to me because uh, I could see with AI, a lot of people losing work, losing their jobs, graphic designers. I mean, now you can do so many things. I mean, Logos, yeah. Uh, yeah. write essays, or whatever it is that you you know you, these different careers are. People, it's their livelihood. Now it's going to all change with this AI for sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, as you said, right? The yeah. the genie in the bottle is out and out and about and doing his thing. And actually, in the uh, previous episode uh, with Jay Adams, we also talk about you know this idea of the role of AI in the world and for artists. And yeah, it's a, I think it's a topic that. It's not going to go away. It's just going to be uh, something that we just have to deal with and, and, yes. and, and work with and figure out the ins and outs. And it's going to look different for every industry, for every artist, even, mm -hmm. you know, how much of a role may or may not have and so on. But uh, yeah, absolutely. And so talking about, the, you know, what, about this piece, what I would love to hear from you is, you know, before even the painting came along, before even you started putting prompts on the AI and so on, you know, what, what were you thinking about? What was kind of happening uh, in your mind as this piece was first like conceived as an idea yes okay well i have to say first of all that making art for me is my therapy it's what okay. kept me safe and feeling well since i was a very small child uh i mean my earliest memories of have been with paper and crayons i mean i never can think back anything beyond that and it's always been a place for me to go to when I'm feeling anxious, when I'm feeling any kind of emotion that I need to explore, it's like a safe haven for me, you know? Mm -hmm. So right now there's so much going on in the world. I mean, not, you know, just this was a few weeks ago that I did this painting. Things are worse now, obviously what's happening. Right. But at the time, what I was really was things that, some of the things that bothered me were climate change, mm -hmm. natural disasters, which are increasing because of climate change. Uh, the air we breathe, you know, and um, pandemics, you know, I right. mean, what's coming down the road next? You know, when you live long enough, you live to see, first of all, history repeating itself, which is strange enough, and whether it's right. politics or economy or certainly, you know, fashion, and we all see how things come around, that goes around faster, so it's easier to see. But there's so, I'm just feeling a lot of, anxiety about what's going on in the world today with the mm -hmm. rise of fascism around the world what's going mm -hmm. on with our political system which is seems very broken it's all very anxiety provo provoking to me so yeah. going when i start to work on a drawing or a painting i, I 
it sounds silly maybe, but I almost go into like a trance-like state. You mm, know, okay. I, when I start, especially with the painting or detailed drawing, I l totally lose myself in the work. Uh, I don't know where it is that I go, but I know sometimes in, in the past when I would put in really like long hours, like 10 hour days, the paintbrush would fall out of my hand in the, while I was working. And I realized that I didn't even know what was happening to me. And all of a sudden I would, the paintbrush would just fall out of my hand because my fingers were frozen from, from working for like eight or <laughs> 10 hours. Without, you know, I forget to eat lunch. I forget to use the bathroom and nothing matters. It all disappears. <laughs> and I'm in this like trance like state. Right. It's very comforting to me, actually, that state mm -hmm. because it blocks everything out. Well, the world is blocked out and I feel happy and safe. Just like when I was a kid, I grew up, you know, mm -hmm. in a, a working class family. There was no artists around. There was nobody encouraged me, but my parents saw that I had talent mm -hmm. and they left me alone, basically, to do what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a very rough neighborhood in the projects, mm -hmm. a lot of working class families. I just felt like... This, I don't belong here. Something, there's got to be something else. <laughs> right. I'm, like if somebody dropped me in this this environment, and it's not, it's not where I want to be. I would resort to, you know, my fantasy world and my drawings and paint. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't start painting until my teens, but certainly always with pencil, colored pencils and crayons. Yeah. So that's kind of where, you know, I went with this painting. I, you know, I, I really felt just feeling a lot of anxiety listening to the news. Mm -hmm. And I said, I got to, I got to express it somehow. And, you know, but the thing that I, I've always drawn to is because I don't do, I don't think I make art that is uh, disturbing or I don't, I don't really like things that are grotesque. A lot mm -hmm. of people are into that look, you know, and I, I feel like there's enough ugly things in the world. I want to bring beauty into the world. So yes, yeah. glamour, Hollywood, right. all those things are always present somewhere, you know, pretty much in my work. I mean, I, I'll mix up errors in telling a story, recreating a classical theme or something. Uh, but it always has the little Hollywood mixed in there. A little Some of like the Hollywood movie poster, right? From the uh, 80s and 70s, 50s. Again, yeah. Exactly. I grew up watching Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers movies when I was a young boy. And mm -hmm. I just I couldn't, I could watch them over and over and over again. You know, it just that whole aesthetic is so beautiful and fantasy and yeah. dramatic and glamorous, you know, yeah. and that's kind of what, you know, what I always lead kind of leads my main thoughts towards, I guess. So mm -hmm. the, even though this painting is about a horrific period, which is in my fantasy is 10 years from now, climate change is worse, fires, disasters, the air is awful. You can't breathe it. Mm -hmm. but the figure looks like a 1940s movie star. I mean, I specifically gave her those eyebrows and that right. world's hairdo because I knew that would evoke the whole feeling. You know, not that it will, doesn't mean it won't come around again, because it probably will, you know, eventually. Yeah, the uh, fashion yeah. tends to return, it's right, uh, as we all know. <laughs> the only thing is, the rule of thumb is, if you wore it the first time around, by the time it comes around the second time, you're too old to wear it again. <laughs> it won't fit anymore. It's a good way to stay young, so that's a good yeah. thing, it's a, it's a safe way to go. Yeah, and, and, and definitely, like, the hair brings us to that era, you know, that hairstyle, right. uh, what she's wearing, too, you know, it kind of, it brings that, yeah, and even the nostalgia of that of those days, right? right? But now on a completely new reality, on a completely yep. new setting that even, you know, people who live those days, you know, this, right. this what she's experiencing, really like the worst case scenario kind of thing, right. you know, the Armageddon, the, you know, the... Uh, the zombie apocalypse type of thing, too, you know, <laughs> yeah. whatever you want to call it, you know, everything that, that we exactly. imagine to be the yeah, worst. I'm paint a zombie because to me that's ugly. <laughs> so I painted a zombie should be a beautiful zombie. A <laughs> beautiful but, zombie. Yeah, with this with this figure, the dress is mm -hmm. kind of kind of the period of the 40s, but it's metallic. It's picking up I, all the colors of the background. And so that made it to me more a little futuristic. So I like exactly. to see that whole idea of is the future, is the past. I mean, it, it all scrambled together. Right. And, and even like, you know, yeah, it has both things, right? The the past and the present and the future. Yes. You know, the, the present is like the ideas, the things that we have experienced, the, even the title COVID, you know, we all have mm -hmm. lived through that at this point. Yes. But uh, then, you know, like even like the, the gas mask that she's wearing, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. you know, it's not a mass that I imagine in the future. It's something like again from it's a little uh, retro, uh, yes, retro, exactly, exactly. It's a little bit, not steam trunk. That's a whole separate thing. But you know, it, does, it definitely has some retro elements. Mm-hmm. So yes, in fact, so the, I'm actually I'm gonna I'm planning on doing a series of this okay. 14 by 14, which is you know my comfort zone is 24 by 30, 24 by 36. That's what I like to paint. Mm-hmm. And it's also good for my studio space, which has gotten smaller. But uh, this 14 by 14 is is very comfortable, so I can finish them, finish them much faster. Because my work takes so many hours. I'm working with tiny brushes most of the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I like the idea of being able to get through a series while I have this in my head. So I'm going to I'm doing at least four to maybe six of this size, different themes, okay. similar but different. But it'll be the same, uh, you know, the same concept of mixing the past with the present with the future, like that. Do and, you work? Oh, and glamour. Ahead. And it's got to be a glamour. It's glamour, be, yes, absolutely. And I think that's, that's also what brings people in first. You know, I remember from yes. uh, looking at, observing people at the booth, brings them in, and then right. they begin to discover all the different elements, all the different layers of meaning, of the narrative that you have behind it. But it's, but it's that appearance, right, that it's, a, it's luring and attracting to us because of our experience with nice. medium, Hollywood, and all these other aspects of life, yeah. 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 As you're working on these pieces because of the complexity and the time that they take to make, uh, are you also already visualizing the other pieces that are coming after? Oh, oh definitely, yeah. In fact, mm-hmm. so... Uh, I, I'm really anxious to get started on the next one. So yes, and a lot of times I'll have the image pretty much worked out in my mind before I even start in. So I know what, what, I'm, what I want it to look like. It's just a matter of finding my way through things and doing research. I always do research before mm-hmm. painting. Um, but things are pretty set in my head. It's almost like I have to get it out now in my head. It's not like I, I don't, I'm not the kind of artist that, that paints and discovers, oh, look at this. Oh, maybe I like this. I'll try this. And mm-hmm. no, it's all there. It's in my brain already. And I just have to get it out onto the canvas or the, or mm-hmm. the uh, paper, whatever it is. Yeah. So a lot of the conceptualization happens in, in, the, in the mind, the brain. You put yeah. it all together. Then the, the act of painting is then translating what's already in your mind into the right. physical appearance, the, you right. know, the application, the painting. All that. And again, I, you know, I don't know where that comes from. It's my process. I don't really yeah. have any formal training. I went to college. I had a ma- I was supposed to be an art teacher. So I majored oh, in education okay. with a minor in art. That's yeah. when I was able to be- paint and you know, get some skills together. And I, had, I certainly learned things, but I never had any really instruction. By the, that point already, I was making art. And I was Mm -hmm. able to do portraits and I was drawing all the time. When I finished the four years of college, I didn't want to, didn't want to be an art teacher in New Jersey. I felt New York was calling. I needed to be there. And I went to Pratt Institute. Mm -hmm. Now I should have, I should have gone to a better college in the beginning. I should have gone to FIT or someplace. If I had a good uh, counselor in high school, (laughs) they would have said, you need to be, you know, you need to go to Rhode Island school of design somewhere else. Not, Patterson State College, you know, <laughs> but I didn't have anybody to tell me that. All I know right. is that when, the, when I went to have my art teacher, it was my same art teacher for four years in high school. Mm-hmm. I went into that, brought my yearbook, which I practically did the yearbook single-handed along with him, all the drawings, all the layouts, everything. I did the yearbook. Uh, that, that's fun because I did the yearbook too. Like, yeah, like I, you know how to I, draw, you do the, all the pictures I was the, and getting. You know, so yeah. but when I went to him to sign the yearbook, he said, I said, well, where are you going to go to college? I said to him, well, Patterson State College, that's what I could afford also at the time. Uh-huh. He said, oh, I'm so disappointed. And I walked away and I said, what is he talking about? Wow. Well, what is it, what is it, what was I supposed to do? No one even, I didn't even know about these other schools. No one told me. My guidance counselor didn't know about them, obviously. They took yeah. going to, and my, my parents were thrilled. To, they, you know, yeah. nobody went to college and my family up to that point. So they thought that was great, you know, but it wasn't what it should have been. So then yeah. I went, I finished the four years in, mm-hmm. in Addison State, and I got into Pratt, in the MFA program, which okay. was great because that really gave me two years of concentrated drawing and painting. Mm-hmm. And I did learn a lot with the drawing instructor. I have to say, the life drawing and all that, all in that whole area, you know, working very traditionally. But the painting, I was left on. I was on my own. The painting uh, professor was this old guy, <laughs> Wickhouse or something. I forget. <laughs> and, you know, at the time. Realism was not popular 
in the art world. It really was not. Everything yeah. was abstract, except expressionism. Yeah. Everybody was making paintings with masking tape. You know, that was all there was. And if you did realism, it's like, oh, that's nice. It's, that's great. You can do that. But nobody seemed that interested or, you know. So they left me and alone. They, yeah, and they, they would put you in the category of illustration or yes, commercial exactly. art. Yeah, I remember. Exactly. So it's inter very interesting. It was, it was very, very uh, strict at the time, we had, what the feelings were. So when it came time to have my thesis show, mm -hmm. they, I mean, I would go see these professor once in a while and show what I was doing. I don't even remember any comments he gave me. My thesis show was full of drag queen images, naked people. I was just kind of exploring, you know, everything. I was, I did a whole series of, uh, of Andy Warhol characters. Okay. Paintings and drawings of Joe D'Alessandro and Candy mm -hmm. Darling and these freaky people. And mm -hmm. that's what my thesis show was all about. And I didn't find out until the show was over from one of the professors that they, they some, one of the, I don't know if it was one or two or three, Professors wanted to ban the show. They thought it wasn't appropriate. Oh, I couldn't wow. believe it. I couldn't believe oh, it. So a, now I'm done with two years. It was so they were so narrow-minded. Mm -hmm. So now I'm done with two years of practice. Now what do I do? I, I want to yeah. make some money, right? But mm -hmm. uh, now I'm in traveling, living in some other state, going to a college and teaching art there. So I'm thinking that this is not what I write still. Mm -hmm. It was an illustrator. Now I didn't even know what illustration was. <laughs> was illustrator who taught at Pratt named David Bird, who was pretty well known because he did the Follies poster on Broadway and a lot oh, of other okay. things, but the Follies poster was iconic. And so I said, well, I'm going to go search out this guy. And I went to go see him and I showed him my work and he looked and he said, I said, can I be an, can I be an illustrator and make a living at this? He said, yeah. definitely, but you can't take that portfolio of art that you have and walk into good housekeeping, they'll they'll faint. He said, <laughs> you know, naked people and drag queens and men dressed up in women's clothes. Uh -huh. So <laughs> you know, we put a portfolio together. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, now we're talking about, well, God, a long time ago, talking about the 70s. Okay. Uh, there were a lot of publishing, small publishers and magazines and book publishers that you could walk around with a portfolio of your work and just walk in. Sometimes you need an appointment, many times you didn't. And you just say, can I see the art director? And they would take a look at your work. I would lug around this big, heavy portfolio with original paintings and drawings in it. First day out, I got my first job doing a paperback cover and that was it. I mean, it, and I never went back after that. I, I was able to get an apartment in the city and I just got one job after the next, after the next kept coming in. And then I eventually got an agent. That's how you get the big, you know, yeah, commercial jobs. And very early on, I was I was uh, lucky to meet uh, this guy named Bill Gold, who had an advertising agency who, who did a lot of movie posters for Hollywood. Okay. And him and a couple of other agencies were working at the time. At at that time, mm -hmm. the studios, the different studios in California, would come to these two or three or four ad agencies that all they do is movie posters. Each agency might get one big job, the same job, and okay. each agency would hire two or three artists to do a different concept. So I would yeah. do, I worked on a lot of movies. I did dozens of movies, but you didn't always see the artwork. Uh, I see. They would, they would pick one from one of the artists and to say, well, all right, this is what we want it to look like. So, so that's so that's where a lot of your aesthetic that you're yes. dealing with as an artist, yes. you know, that's where it comes from. That yes, no, I see movie it's really posters. interesting. Movie mm -hmm. posters, absolutely. Uh, they would send you. They would send me home with a big stack of eight by tens of the from the movie, and mm -hmm. sometimes they gave you a very specific concept or a design. And other times they said, "Go home and see what you can do with this." Yeah. And that would do a very, very elaborate pencil drawing, which I still even have some of them. And then I would do a painting, a full painting minus the type. Uh -huh. uh, and then if you you got paid pretty well for that, if they picked you and they used your poster, then you got like twice the money. Oh, okay. So was, every, that's how it worked. And the yeah. only one that, like, like the, one of the more famous ones that I did was The Wiz for Diana Ross, Michael oh, Jackson. Okay. And I actually did the type on that one, but then they flipped the whole thing and made it look like a reflection in the water. I didn't do it twice, the painting. Okay. <laughs> and Buck Rogers was another one. But yes, it's always about, uh, of course, uh -huh. you had to make everybody look beautiful, look their exactly. best. And it was the movie world, you know? Right, right. This is a time before 
Uh, you know, the uh, the Photoshop filters that, uh, you know, oh, use okay. and all that now. This is before digital. This is, <laughs> exactly. you know, nothing even digital yet. That so, and at what point as you're doing the illustration and working on this, at what point do you also begin to build your own, you know, yes. work with your own ideas that you want to create? Is this something yeah. simultaneously or something that you put a pause on as you were working on this? Well, you know, where does that come from? You know, the thing was, I wanted to, I wanted to earn a living. I wanted to have a nice lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I, it was it was months later, maybe almost a year after I was out of crap and I was busy working on it, job after job. I was getting one after the other all the time. A, a gallery in, in the city called me and wanted to see what I've been up to because they saw my thesis show and they mm -hmm. must be interested. I said, gee, I'm sorry, I don't have anything new to show because mm -hmm. I, I was so focused on being successful at what I was doing that yeah. I really put the fine art whole concept aside. Now, luckily... I had to wait quite a while because for good and bad, I was very successful. I was mm -hmm. I'm very lucky that I had such a good career, but it did keep me from making art for myself, which was, which was difficult. I didn't even realize for a long time what I, what I was missing. You know, I needed to feed myself. And yeah. I was lucky enough to get a, a uh, campaign with Camel Cigarettes in the 90s now. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, for three years, I did... Camel cigarette ads, about, I would say about almost 80% of the ads. It was after Joe Camel was done, they would finish with that cartoon of a camel. Mm -hmm. And they wanted cigarette girls and pinup girls and girls with fez hats and all this. Okay. Uh, and, and the whole original concept started out with, uh, it was present, but it was the future. Or there was the same thing I'm doing now. It's almost, <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's, it's interesting, it's all come around. Uh, for example, there was the, one of the images I had to do, uh, I mean, they did a lot of pinups, so that was the 50s mm -hmm. look. Then they wanted a 40s thing, and then, you know, the famous photo of the sailor kissing the woman, bending her back was, I did a version of that, but it had to do with the, with the it was a close up and there was cigarettes were in there somewhere. <laughs> anyway, point is, they paid me a lot of money. It was really great. And I, because I got so much money, I was able to stop working for a month in between each campaign and, and, do a painting, do a drawing, do a painting for myself. Oh, okay, okay. So that's that's kind of where you started to pull yeah. back. Yes. So and, and I, I bet after you did the first painting, like that was like I, I can't stop anymore. Well, I have opposite. Yes, of course. Then nice. was, you know, that's you know, I can't believe I, all this time has gone by and I haven't made any work for myself and I I, I wasn't feeding my soul, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so yeah, then I had to figure out ways to do work in between jobs and. Uh, and at what point do you make the move to Miami from California? Well, I was in New York. Oh, from New York. Okay. It, was, it was New York City. From New York. Okay. In the same apartment for a very long time. Um, so I guess what happened was you know things, things went digital, mm -hmm. and this is when I was, was still working for Campbell, and I'm hearing other artists saying. I'm not, this work's drying up. I don't have any work. I can't get, you know, I was thinking, what are they talking about? I'm, I was busy because the camel things took me a chunk of time. And then I just went off and did my own thing. I wasn't looking for other work. And I didn't realize that everything was going digital. Yeah, right. Book jackets, everything, the ads, whatever it was. So when the camel campaign was over, three years that was, um, I had a, I got a job for a, from a publisher downtown for a romance cover romance book cover which I did hundreds of and I walked in with this big oil painting and th these young art directors came running out of their offices they're all coming around well, look at this look at this look at this I'm thinking what the hell's going on <laughs> what well, it's a painting this is what I do you know there was like they hadn't seen an, an oil painting done this way because everything I had gone digital already and I, I was like I said I'm a dinosaur I can't believe the, the, the reaction that I had to this. And painting. that happened very quickly, you know. Very it's well, just kind of like what we look at now. The period that I was yeah. busy doing the camel is, and it really flipped. It was, it, it just, you know, it, it was no I mean, nobody wanted to wait for an oil painting to dry. Nobody, Everybody wanted fast and cheap. All the ad mm -hmm. agencies, everything was about fast and cheap. I mean, in the past, you know, I, I, I had time to do photo shoots, which I, mm -hmm. I still do even for the romance covers. I, I'm still creating a few a year. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, for the, you know, for the movie poster look, for example, I had a headshot of the actor. I would have to get a model to shoot the body and get the costume and everything. So I could have the right mm -hmm. reference to create the image for the, for the movie poster. But, you know, by the time everything went digital, 
these young art directors are asking me, oh, we like this look, you know, we want, this is what we want. And they would go into this whole elaborate uh, mm -hmm. concept of what they wanted. And I said, well, do you know what's involved in doing that? This is what I, ha I have to rent, I have to get models, I have to rent props, I have to rent costumes. They had mm -hmm. no clue of what went yeah, on with the art that they loved so much that I created in the past. So a lot of those jobs fell through because they weren't willing to spend the money or wait as long as it would take to, to get done. They'd find somebody who would do it all digitally. Right, right. Now and, forget and, about it. Yeah, and, and now that cycle now is, so that, that was a big jump, right? Now we're going to the next jump, which is the AI jump, right? Now yes, it's kind of like exactly. life repeats itself. Uh, exactly. Fast, quick uh, adopt, adoptance of that technology uh, comes to change. Yeah. Revolution, you, need, you need a little bit of talent to make amazing yeah. images now. Before there was, you know, it was this group, but it wasn't a huge group of people like myself and other illustrators that mm -hmm. could create beautiful things realistically, photorealistically, painterly, whatever it was. Uh, you know, so we were always kept busy, but right. now once everything really went digital, it opened up to so many more people that just oh, yeah. the computer did all the work, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. now AI. It's all, you can't even believe your eyes anymore. You don't know what's <laughs> real and what is it. And what is it? Yeah. And, and even like, I, I was watching this morning, uh, they were showing, uh, even like some people are taking, making those, uh, deep fake uh, videos where they take like somebody in the news room. Oh, saying yeah. a, a news that doesn't exist, you know, oh, they change yeah. it and they edit. So like how easy oh, it would be for scary. people to get confused. It's very know? scary of what could happen yeah. in the future. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I and still, I think, yes. Yeah. And that brings us back to this painting, you know, uh, and thank you for sharing your trajectory. Cause now, now I'm looking at the painting with brand new eyes. So oh, where you've been, you, you uh -huh. know, what you have gone through, uh, your experience. And now it's like, I'm looking at it, it, it looks totally fresh. Oh my God. It's so interesting. I didn't know myself how I came around a circle. Like I'm talking about things going on in circles. That's me. I'm a, <laughs> in, a circle. In a way, the, the painting becomes, uh, a, you know, a self-portrait in, in the sense of, of seeing that cycle, you know, yes. and, and of change mm -hmm. and evolution for the better and for the worse. You know, I think change, you know, has both sides of the coin, uh, the, the good and the bad. And, uh, uh, now, tell me about, you know, as you made this work and, and maybe some of the other ones too, uh, what is some of the reaction you get? Because now, of course, with social media and all, you know, that we have immediate feedback, you know, what is some of the reactions that you get from the public when they confront themselves with some of the images that you put out? Well, I have to say, you know, on Instagram, which I mostly put my things up on, uh, I get a lot of wonderful comments. I, don't, I, can't, mm -hmm. I don't, can't think of any negative things that anybody's ever said. Uh, it's very nice to hear people in, be encouraging other artists saying how much they appreciate the work and how it, it uh, mm -hmm. what makes them want to do better. Uh, mm -hmm. People will ask, I'll answer any question they may ask me about my process, you know. So uh, I would say in general, it's just, you know, very positive because, you know, the kind of, again, because it's attractive mm -hmm. to the eye, uh, People like to look at it. They enjoy seeing it. You know, it's, I'm not forcing them to look at anything too grotesque. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, no, no. There's, there's definitely uh, that appeal that brings us in. Yes. And uh, no, I love this. I could almost see this painting with a companion piece. I, I'm looking forward to see what comes out next. So you know, <laughs> from your studio. <laughs> uh, what in your mind when you see this painting? What is she looking at? What is she looking at? Mm -hmm. uh, she, I think she's looking at the devastation that is behind her is in, also in front of her, but she's very stoic about it. And, you know, I think it's a comment about how I feel about women in general, that the, mm -hmm. the, first of all, I think they're definitely the strongest sex mm -hmm. uh, between the two sexes. You know, men, if they had to have babies, would be the end of the world because yeah. I don't believe a man could go through childbirth. So... She's Most confident. People, She's very yes, confident. I think a lot of the a lot of the images I have, my female images, always are very, very strong women. You know, using if using the sexuality as a strength, as a you know point of strength, uh, and no matter what's going on, no matter how horrific the background is, putting on that lipstick and putting on that eye makeup and <laughs> go ahead, go forward. So you bet that even behind that mask, there's a oh, beautiful. Oh, definitely. Oh, completely. 
course. She's got <laughs> her gloss and she's got her lips on. She can't the house without them. You don't mess around with that, right? <laughs> it's got to be all done. It's got to be all done. Uh, you know, uh, Victor, thank you so much for for sharing with us. I think it's been really fun to uh, you know to chat about this work. This this piece, as I mentioned, will be on context uh, during Art Basel Miami this coming uh, December. So to our friends, we want to invite everyone who uh, is listening to come and check us out. Uh, context will be there with Art Miami as well. Yes. And it's going to be really fun from uh, December 5th, I believe, to the 10th yes. or so. Yes, to the 10th. Yeah, and uh, I, I'm sure... Uh, Victor, you will join us for the opening and be there as well, celebrating Please. with all the other artists who will be around. So it's going to be a great, Absolutely. great, and great day. And a great Argentinian restaurant for us to go to if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. So uh, if you enjoy this, also this work, please uh, send us a message. Uh, this work uh, is also available through Teletri Contemporary Gallery, uh, plus other works uh, from Victor that you are more than welcome to check out from our website, TeletriContemporary.com, or also uh, from rc.net. So... Uh, Victor, uh, one last question for you. What's uh, what's coming up for uh, you know for the next couple of weeks uh, as you're working? What's in the easel? Just a quick little preview without saying too much. Uh, actually, there's nothing on the easel at the moment. Okay. I had to take a little break for a little uh, medical situation I had, but I'm I'm really. What, I'm, what's in the mental easel? In the head is glamour is the future it's the past it's you know there's a, it's a big jumble of things i'm not sure exactly what they're going to look like yet but they're definitely in there and they want to come it. out so I, I have to get going I'm, hopefully in the next uh, two weeks i'll be resuming and i'll be starting in on drawing and, and Very good. getting my images to pull together well congratulations on all the work that you're doing i think this time in which we're living right now is the perfect time for your work you know because we're yes. looking back as we're looking ahead so yeah. it's like we're in that middle which is really yeah. wonderful so thank you thank, thank you. you thank you victor thank you for everyone uh, listening and i uh, will see you in the next episode have a great rest of your day goodbye Bye. thank you for joining us today on 33pa your gateway to the world of art if you've enjoyed today's episode as much as we have we greatly appreciate your support Consider leaving us a review and don't forget to connect with us on all social media platforms at 33 Contemporary. The work of art that was featured in today's episode, along with our entire gallery inventory, is available for purchase online through artsy.net. Should you have any questions or inquiries, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at www.33contemporary.com. Your support means the world to us as we continue this artistic journey together. Until next time, stay inspired and keep exploring the world of art with 33PA, the Art Insider Podcast.